This is lecture one of module one in the book Problem Solving Guide for Mechanics and Thermodynamics, One Dimensional Motion. Motion in one dimension is motion along a straight line, forwards, backwards. In this module, we will be considering only horizontal motion, the car driving, driving along a straight, flat road, and vertical motion in a gravitational field, straight up or straight down. We will be using the concepts of distance, speed, acceleration, and time to describe the motion of objects. Where are they? How fast are they going? Which way are they accelerating? So let's start with motion in, at a constant speed in a straight line, the simplest type of motion. A car travels at a constant speed of 60 miles per hour for five hours. How far does it go? Straightforward problem. Don't think. What's the equation? Don't guess. Your answer should not be a guess. Know what the answer is, because it makes sense. The speed of 60 miles an hour means that the car traveled 60 miles per hour, 60 miles each hour. If you go 60 miles each hour for five hours, that's 300 miles. That should make sense to you. You shouldn't need an equation for that. What if the speed is not constant? It's difficult to travel 60 miles an hour for five hours in straight. You have to stop for gas or charging. You gotta pee, maybe get hungry. When the speed is not constant, we use a representative speed, which is the average speed. The average speed during any time interval is the total distance traveled divided by the total time. And you knew this already before you came to this class. V average, which is V sub AVG, or you can put a bar over the V, just two different ways of representing it, two different symbols, defined, that's what the three lines means, defined as the total distance divided by the total time, the definition of the average speed. So if a sprinter goes 400 meters in 50 seconds, his average speed is eight meters every second. 400 meters divided by 50 seconds. Total distance divided by total time, eight meters every second. In the special case, when the speed is changing linearly from the initial speed to the final speed during some time interval, the average speed is simply the middle speed. It's the average of the initial speed and the final speed. For example, let's say a motorcyclist is going 30 meters a second. The speed is 30 meters per second. The initial speed is 30 meters per second. Then hits some traffic, slows linear, linearly to a speed of 20 meters per second in a time interval of five seconds. What's the average speed over the five seconds? Since the speed is changing linearly, the average speed is the middle speed, the average of the starting speed and the final speed. So V average is V initial plus V final divided by two, this is not really a physics equation, it's a math equation. The average of two numbers is if you add them up and divide by two. This is true only if the speed is changing linearly from V initial to V final. In this case, it's 25 meters per second, right? Goes from 30 to 20, linearly the average speed is 25 meters every second. A good example in which the average speed is not given by the above equation is that sprinter. If you use that equation, you say, well, the sprinter starts from rest, which is zero, maybe ends up at eight meters per second. His average speed is not four meters per second. Gets up the to top speed very quickly. Now let's get the distance traveled by the motorcycle over the five seconds. And we already talked about this equation. If we know the average speed, we can use this. All we did was multiply both sides by t. It's the same equation. V average is distance over time. We put the t on the other side, we get distance is rate times time, and I'm sure you've seen that equation before. So 25 meters every second for five seconds, 25 meters each second for five seconds, that's 125 meters. So the distance the motorcycle travels over that deceleration is 125 meters. So far we have talked about distance, speed, and time. Now let's talk about acceleration. When you're going only in one dimension, 
In a straight line, the only way to accelerate is to change speed. So consider this problem. A car goes from 0 to 60 miles per hour linearly in 12 seconds. What's the, its acceleration? How quickly is its speed changing? What is its rate of change of speed? Don't think, what equation do I use? Wondering what equation to use is not a problem-solving strategy, and it's not a strategy that will be successful in this course. You have to think, what's going on? How can you describe to somebody the rate at which the speed is changing? Zero to 60 miles an hour in 12 seconds, what's the rate of change of speed? Imagine the speedometer, digital or analog. If you have a needle in your car, okay, here's the speedometer, it's going up, going up smoothly, it's rotating clockwise smoothly. What's happening? How quickly is it changing? You should pause the video and think about it until you have an answer that makes perfect sense. The speed of the car is changing by five miles per hour each second. That's the acceleration. It starts at rest. After one second, it's going five miles an hour. After two seconds, it's going 10. After three seconds, it's going 15. After 12 seconds, it's going 60 miles an hour. Every second, the speed increases by five miles per hour. The acceleration is five miles per hour per second. Right? Makes sense. Some don't like the units of miles per hour per second. But to those used to the English system of units, miles per hour each second is the most intuitive unit of acceleration. Now let's return to the slowing motorcyclist. She went from 30 meters per second to 20 meters per second over five seconds at a constant rate. What's her acceleration over the five seconds? Well, we shouldn't need an equation for that. How quickly is her speed changing? Her speed is changing by negative two meters per second each second. There's three different ways to write that. The first is minus two meters per second per second. Next is minus two, and you can put meters per second in the numerator, and then seconds in the denominator, and the third way is minus two meters per second squared. I think the last way is the most non-intuitive. What the heck is a square second? Meters per second each second describes the acceleration. I like that better. So we've covered the horizontal direction. Now let's do the vertical direction, and the vertical direction involves the gravitational force, the gravitational acceleration. What do you think the acceleration due to gravity is on the planet of the Earth in miles per hour each second? If you drop a rock off a cliff, how fast is it going after three seconds? What's the rate of change of the speed of something when you drop it off a cliff? When the object is in free fall under the surface of the Earth, it's 22 miles per second. 22 miles per hour per second. Zero to 60 in under three seconds, right? Zero to 60, you be at three seconds, you're going like 66. The Tesla P100B can do that on a level road, less than three seconds. The acceleration due to gravity is about 9.81 meters per second each second. Same acceleration, different units, 32 feet per second each second. We use lowercase g to represent the acceleration due to gravity, 22 miles an hour each second. Since the goal of this class is to develop problem solving skills and not to be able to determine where an arrow will land with any precision, you're going to have to include air drag if you want to do that. We are going to assume that the acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second each second. With this approximation, our answers will not be precise, but if we ignore air drag, they're going to be wrong anyway. In fact, ignoring air drag results in a much, much bigger error in most cases. Even with a javelin, there's a lot of aerodynamics associated with a javelin. You can't ignore air drag when you throw a javelin. And if you throw a baseball or a hit a golf ball, forget it. The air is crucial. So we're going to use 10 meters per second squared for G. Let's see how this works. A sandbag is dropped from a hot air balloon. How far does it fall in four seconds? The equation is asking, the question is asking for the distance. How far does it fall in four seconds? Well, drop from rest. Gravity changes its speed by 10 meters per second every second. 
After four seconds, it's traveling at 40 meters per second. It goes from zero to 40 meters per second smoothly. Its average speed over the four seconds is 20 meters per second. If it goes 20 meters each second for four seconds, it travels 80 meters, right? If we had to use 9.8 meters per second squared for the acceleration due to gravity, we would have some equation and we would have a calculator and we would get 78.4 meters. That is close enough to 80 for me. We're forced to do more math than physics and we're relying on equations rather than thinking. This class is about thinking and fundamentally understanding the principles involved. Equations are fine if you fundamentally understand them, so let's understand them. What's the equation for acceleration in a straight line? Acceleration in a straight line is the rate of change of speed. The change in speed divided by the time taken. V final minus V initial, that's the change in speed divided by the time. This should make sense. Let's use it to get the acceleration of the car that went from zero to 60 miles an hour in 12 seconds. The final speed is 60 miles an hour, the initial speed zero, the time is 12 seconds. The equation gives us five miles per hour per second, which we knew already. We don't need an equation to get that. Now let's consider the motorcyclist that went from 30 meters per second to 20 meters per second in five seconds. Here's the equation, V final minus V initial over T. V final is 20 meters per second, V initial is 30 meters per second, the time is five seconds. The equation gives us minus two meters per second each second, and we knew that already. There are two more useful equations of kinematics, but they are not principal equations. They're a combination of the things we already talked about. The definition of acceleration as the rate of change of the speed in one dimension, the definition of the average speed, distance over time, and the de definition of the average, which is really mathematical equation, v initial plus v final divided by two. So here are the two physics equations, and those should make perfect sense to you and we add the definition of the average, v initial plus v final divided by two, if the acceleration is linear. We can combine the last two equations to get that. We're just plugging in the expression for v average. The equation for the acceleration can be rewritten, v final equals v initial plus at. This also should make perfect sense. The speed that you end up at is your starting speed, v initial, plus the rate of change of the speed times how long you did that rate of change. Now we can substitute this expression into the equation for x. So this equation for x has a v final in it. And we're going to stick this expression for v final into it. And now it looks like this. And we can rearrange this to get this equation. We derive this equation from the principal equations of motion, the definition of acceleration and the definition of average speed. Similarly, we can solve this equation for t and substitute it into this equation. And we get this. And we can rearrange this algebraically to get this equation. Another equation of kinematics, but it's not a principal equation. This is really much less intuitive. V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2AX. But if the problem doesn't ask for the time and you don't have the time, it's very convenient because there's no T in here. Instead of doing two equations, two unknowns, you can do one equation and one unknown. But there's no new physics in this equation. If you use this equation to get an answer, I recommend confirming it with a more intuitive equation, an equation that makes sense. So the equations that we use to derive these two equations assume the acceleration's constant. V initial plus V final over two equals V average assumes the acceleration's constant. V final equals V initial plus AT assumes the acceleration constant. If the acceleration is not constant, these equations are no good. You cannot use these equations if the acceleration is not constant. So let's use these two new equations to confirm previous results. So the motorcyclist that went from 30 to 20 meters per second over a time of five seconds, we calculated she went 125 meters because she averaged 25 meters per second over five seconds. 
25 meters each second for five seconds is 125 meters. Now let's use a different equation to get the distance. One half AT squared plus V initial T. The distance is what we want. The acceleration is minus two meters per second every second. The time is five seconds. The initial speed is 30 meters per second. So we can plug in all those numbers. First one is one half times two is one. Five squared is 25. There's a negative sign there. That's minus 25 meters. And then the last expression is just plus 150 meters. That's 125 meters, which is what we got with the average. Now let's use this equation to get the distance. V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2AX. So V final is 20. Square that, we get 400. V initial is 30. Square that, we get 900. The acceleration is minus 2 meters per second squared, and then we need an X in there. And we subtract 900 from both sides. We get minus 500. Divide by minus 4, we get X. Minus 500 divided by minus 4 is plus 125 meters. Same thing. All correct paths lead to the same solution. Now let's do the sandbag. We dropped the sandbag. We figured it was going average of 20 meters per second. For four seconds, it goes 80 meters. The distance is 80 meters. Let's get the distance with this. The acceleration is minus 10 meters per second every second. The time is four seconds. The initial speed is zero. But before we start, we got an X in there, okay? Let's get used to Module two, we're doing X and Y, and we use Y for the vertical. So let's just stick in a Y there, all right? Acceleration in the Y direction, minus 10 meters per second, every second. Time is five seconds, initial speed zero. One half times four squared 16, one half of that is eight. Eight times 10 is 80, so we get minus 80. It fell 80 meters, I mean 80 meters downward, which is what we got before. Now let's use this. V final is 40 meters per second. Square that, we get 1600. V initial is zero. Acceleration is minus 10. 1600 divided by minus 20. That's minus 80 meters. Again, all correct paths lead to the same solution. This should be no surprise because the equations we just used came from the principal equations. It's the same equation. So here are the four equations of kinematics. X is V average T. V final equals V initial plus AT. X is one half AT squared plus V initial T. And V final squared equals V initial squared plus two AX. So now you know the equations of kinematics. These equations are all the knowledge you need to solve one dimensional motion problems. This is not enough. It is not even close. In fact, knowing the equations is virtually useless if you don't have problem solving skills. We're going to give you the equations. They're going to be at the top of every exam. You will not need to memorize them. Knowing the equations of motion is as useful for solving physics problems as knowing the steps of juggling is for being able to juggle. So here are the steps to follow to be able to juggle. My favorite is number seven, catch the balls in the order that you threw them. And even better is number eight, repeat. Easier said than done. You can study these steps for juggling. You can know the steps for juggling. You can memorize the steps for juggling. You can put the eight steps on flashcards and memorize them. You can use a highlighter marker and highlight the heck out of the rules. But the only way to become a good juggler is to practice juggling. Solving physics problems is no different. It's a skill. Skill can only be developed through practice. Students often say to me, Professor, I understand the material and I can follow your lecture, but I'm bombing the exams. Of course you're bombing the exams. You can't learn to juggle by watching other people juggle. You can't learn to solve physics problems by watching other people solve physics problems. The good news is that problem solving skills are universally applicable, not just physics. Being able to figure things out is a key skill for success in every endeavor. They're not exclusive to physics problems. So here's Dr. Meyer's rules for problem solving. Understand the problem, draw a diagram. Understand the diagram. Think 
about what is going on. Estimate the answer. Take a shot. How big is it going to be? Plan the attack. Sometimes you can see all the way to the solution. If I do this, I do this, then I'm going to get the answer. Sometimes you can't see all the way. It's too hard. And the answer is do something. After you understand what's going on, calculate. Oh, now I see. I get it now. Plan the attack. Execute the attack. Then check your answer. Does it make sense? Use a different equation. We use different equations all the time to figure out, ah, now I really understand what's going on. Don't be in a hurry to go to the next problem. Make sure you understand this one fundamentally. Notice there's no rule that says thumb through the book looking for an equation to use. This is a rotten strategy. Equations and formulas are ways to avoid thinking. Ooh, if I have a formula, I can stop thinking. And just plug the numbers in. Rules and protocols are ways to avoid thinking. Rules and protocols are for people that cannot think. If you see this, do this. Don't think about it. If you see this, do this. That's what a computer does. If then. It's an if then statement. Physics is very different from most other subjects because there's very little to know. And what you need to know is going to be at the top of the test. Chemistry and biology have a lot more knowledge because they're more complicated. The human body is tremendously complicated. There's a lot going on. We're throwing a ball and we're trying to find out where it lands. We're dropping a sandbag and trying to figure out where it is after four seconds. Simple system. You might study for chemistry or biology tests with flashcards. There's no flashcards for 131. You don't take notes in 131. What are you going to write down? It's all thinking and problem solving. That's how you succeed. Trying to figure out what the heck is going on, struggling to reach a new level of understanding. What the heck is going on here? Students who embrace the struggle early in the course will be much more successful than those who try to avoid the struggle. Avoiding the struggle is you get a problem you don't know how to do, and you get somebody to tell you how to do it. That does not develop your problem solving skills. That's like somebody swimming your laps for you when you want to become a better swimmer. You got to get in the pool and struggle. That's how you become a better swimmer. The exams will have new problems on them. Sometimes they hand out the exam, student raises his hand, I never saw a problem like this before. I say, get used to it. I believe you. Problems that require you to figure it out for yourself, to draw a diagram and think. The only way to develop the ability to figure things out for yourself is to practice figuring things out for yourself. Of course it is. What else would it be? If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. Physics is CrossFit for your brain. Who's in? I can't wait.